So welcome everyone to Headache Biology 101. Today we're really pleased to have with us Dr. Rami Burstein of Harvard Medical School and Beth Israel Deaconess. Uh, Dr. Burstein is the John Headley White Professor of Anesthesia and Neuroscience at Harvard Medical School and he's also the Vice Chair of Neuroscience in the Anesthesia Department at Beth Israel Deaconess. Um, and as I was reading about some of his work and um, reached out to invite him, I was really impressed by the range of important discoveries he's made related to headaches and specifically migraines. Um, so he has discovered, uh, while he was in graduate school, the spinal hypothalamic tract. And these are neurons uh, projecting from the spinal cord into the brain, into the hypothalamus, which was not known before his work at all. Um, he has worked on the roles of peripheral and central sensitization of nerves um, in migraines and their role in the pathophysiology and treatment of these migraines. Um, also excitingly, he's made discoveries about the mechanisms of action of several anti-migraine drugs. Um, and he's also made discoveries about the neurobiology of photophobia or the impact of light on migraines. Um, and he's developed a new therapeutic for that. And I think he's gonna touch on that towards the end of his uh, talk today. Um, and he's also recently developed an interest in the glymphatic system in migraines. And these are blood vessels that help to clear uh, waste out of the brain in the central nervous system. Um, and yeah, we're very, very excited to have him. He has many honors and awards. I won't read them all. Um, but I just want to note he has prestigious or, uh, awards from the American Headache Society, the International Headache Society, the National Advisory Neurological Disorder and Stroke Council. Um, and if anyone is interested in the International Headache Conference this year, he's on the scientific program committee for that. Um, so we're really delighted to have him here today. Um, he's offered to do something really cool, an event that's even more interactive than some of our 101 series in general. Um, he asked that, you know, kind of do a Q&A session um, and that people can turn on their video um, and just, you know, go ahead and ask a question. You don't even have to raise your hand. He'd love to be interrupted. Um, and if you prefer, you can type it into the chat box and I will read it out. Um, and if you did submit questions in the registration form, we had a ton of them and they were awesome. We might not read out all of those. So feel free to just, you know, turn on your video and ask the question. Uh, whenever you like. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Rami. Good. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, so first, thank you for having me. It's really fun to do it. I usually talk to clinicians who treat migrant patients, and it's a completely different lecture, or to scientists who do only headache for 20 and 30 years, and they know everything that I know beside the things that they didn't publish yet. And the lectures are very different. This one, Headache 101, is is uh, very different. I originally I prepared a lecture that is all about photophobia, about trying to answer one question. How in the world light can make a headache more painful and what, what can we do with it? Uh, but then yesterday I received two pages of questions that are by far the best questions I got in the last 20 years from you guys about migraine and uh, about headache. And as I got this question, it seems so naive because uh, because you don't know. Uh, it seems as if it'd be way more interesting to really have a conversation and a discussion rather than me giving you lectures, a lecture about photophobia. I'll try to touch on it later, but you have to understand, I can talk for 32 hours and never tell you the same thing twice and take each hour to talk about one aspect of migraine well, there is uh, years of knowledge that, that uh, coming all the way to, to date. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, but that is not where we have, that is not where we have to start where you barely know what migraine is. So let me uh, start really being guided by the question that you asked that uh, I got yesterday and uh, try to give you a more overall view about what migraine is and what headache is and as we go through that, I will try to share screen and maybe uh, pull in one or two uh, slides here and there to just show you that everything that I tell you, I don't make it up. There are, there are data and there are, there, are, there are solid evidence and data from studies that we've done that, uh, that, give us the, that give us the right to say what we say because it's all based on knowledge and that, uh, that uh, Many people worked on for a long time. 
Okay, so with this, I, I'm ready to start. So maybe the most fundamental question that I got is what is migraine and what's the difference between migraine and headache? And if you don't define that, you're, you're gonna be lost for the rest of, of this talk. So uh, if you look at the International Committee for Classification of Headache, there are almost 300 different kinds of headaches. And you really have to do a headache uh, fellowship to, to be able to understand uh, the difference between migraine and other headaches. So migraine is only one of them. And of course, there are many different kinds of migraine and there are many headaches uh, that uh, come with a migraine-like headache, but they are not migraine, they are headaches. So what is it that, what is it that define migraine that makes it such an interesting headache that makes us all study? So unlike other headaches, migraine most commonly happen on one side of the head and not on the entire, on the entire head. Not only it happens on one side of the head, but many times we see, so in many patients, it will only happen in one side, maybe on the eye or maybe on the temple, or maybe the back of the head, but it will be on one side. And many times it is so important for this disease to be, for this disorder to happen on one side, that in the, in, within a single attack, it will jump from the left side to the right side, right side, left side, and not be on both sides at the same time, to which the mechanism is completely unknown. How can it, how can, I mean, we understand patient well, migraine begins in one side, and then uh, during the course of the attack, as there is recruitment and sensitization of neurons in the higher order neurons, it's spread from one side to both sides. But it's, very, it's almost impossible for us to put any concept now or how migraine it starts on one side, jump to the other side and leave one side. What is it that turn on and off the switch between the right side and the left side, number one. Number two, migraine is really the only headache that clearly throbs with that follow the changes in intracranial pressure that we measure uh, with pulsation of doubt, where intracranial pressure go 4, 10, 4, 10, 4, 10 millimeter mercury. And it is also a headache that momentarily becomes more painful if we bend over, sneeze, cough, do anything, any effort that increase intracranial pressure. It is, this is, these are things that are related to the headache. Migraine is the only headache that is clearly hereditary, that, uh, that runs in family very tightly. And the more genes that are there, if both parents have it, it's almost impossible for the kids not to have it and the headaches are more painful. If only one have it, usually it's the mom because it's more dominant in women. Uh, it will most likely come to the kids. Boys get it earlier between age five and eight. Girls get it the onset is later between age 12 and 14 or 16. Uh, boy, in boys, it goes away faster. In, 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 in uh, women, it stays until the menopause, and usually it will go away. Uh, it is in women, it is in many women, not in all, it, it, uh, it is commonly associated with the first day of menses. It happens usually within 48 hours on both sides of the beginning of, of menses. And let's just take symptoms. Migraine is the only the headache that comes with nausea, with vomiting, with yawning, frequent urination, a nasal congestion, a lacrimation, tearing of one eye, feeling hot and sweaty or cold and shivering, with muscle tenderness that begin two to three hours before the migraine starts, or migraine tenderness that begins only during the headache with a, with a whole host of craving for food, a, being really tired, with getting bars of a, irritability and anger a, before the onset of migraine and into the migraine with developing anxiety that does not follow usually other headache. A, with symptoms that happen before the headache starts, 
that we call, we put under the umbrella that is called aura, like migrant patient would see flashes of lights uh, and mostly black and white or gray that cover the visual field that many times will become a zigzag line that looks like a moon, but it's a zigzag that will last for about 20 minutes. And in many cases will give rise to a scotoma. They will, that is, they will say that they are losing part of the visual field and that will stay there for 30 to 60 minutes and then the headache will come. Migraine is the only headache that comes with tingling that begin in the fingers and move along the, and for, for, from the finger to the hand, to the forearm, to the arm, to the neck, to the face, to the lips and the tongue. And then, and then it goes, the tingling goes away and it gives, it take, and what takes place is it become numbness. And the numbness can continue for hours and hours and hours, the feeling of, of numbness in the face and the fingers. Uh, migraine is the only headache that come with expressive and receptive aphasia. They either, what they want to say today is Thursday. They cannot come up with the word Thursday, or they can come up with the word Thursday, but they cannot, they, when they try to say it, it doesn't come right. Their, their motor regulation of speech is affected. Migraine is the only addict that come with a transient amnesia. So they're talking about cognitive decline or brain fog. They, you talk to them, they don't understand what you tell them. They, they, uh, they can't remember, like, like they, they live, they're in a home and they know that the Bible is the third door to the right and they'll go to the second door. And then it goes away completely and it's a couple. So all these uh, sensory and uh, cognitive deficits uh, or either sensory gain or sensory loss completely disappear at the end of the migraine attack. It is, so it's all transient and, and it goes away. So, uh, of course, uh, and of course, migraine to follow your questions. Migraine is really the only headache, the only headache that consistently and well documented triggered by sleeping too little, sleeping too little, too much, uh, getting stressed uh, during the letdown stress, right? Friday night, weekends, vacation, uh, skipping meals being too hot or too cold, uh, changes in uh, pressure like during flying or when the weather change, a whole host of things. If you look at trigger, at triggers of mind, at triggers of the headaches, at uh, symptoms that appear before the onset of the headache, symptoms that appear during the headache, all those are unique to mind. They don't belong to other headaches. So, by definition, well, it makes migraine more interesting, but it also, uh, but it also uh, defines a very complex neurological disorder uh, that affects almost every, every system in the brain, sensory and motor and cognitive and endocrine and affective and, and, and in, in multiple aspects. And of course, each of these is huge amount of knowledge a huge amount of black holes that we don't know. And, uh, and I think that along this line, uh, I'm trying to navigate my talk and explain to you, we do have some concept that, that uh, we know enough to explain that, uh, that will allow us to explain to you why, where, where is the thinking today on how skipping a meal trigger my head, how stress trigger my head, how Sleeping too little, trigger, trigger migraine. Uh, it is, uh, some of it is still speculative because the data are not all completely, are all completely said was in the clinical and the preclinical domains, but uh, we know enough to define a ballpark in which we conceptualize how it happened and we operate in, in our research. So, I think that uh, before we before we get on the same page with that, it would be very difficult for you to follow uh, where where I'm going. So so uh, maybe uh, maybe this is uh, the right time 
for me to slow down for a minute and see if you have any question based on the question, because you asked so many questions about headache and migraine that I'm happy to open it for a discussion here before, before I go to some data. So I can get us started. I think one of the questions that came up with a couple of people um, who signed up were uh, cluster headaches, if you could explain what they're like and if there are any similarities or connections. So sure. So cluster headache is by far the most painful of all headaches. It is associated with the largest incidence of suicide among my patients. Uh, because it's a headache that is so beyond belief that uh, that uh, it's very difficult not to become emotional when you see a patient that can get in that. So while headache affect mostly the periorbital area and the temple and the back of the head, uh, but by far the periorbital the area around the eye and the temple, a uh, cluster headache uh, is uh, affecting mostly the maxillary part of the trigeminal nerve, not the ophthalmic. And the pain is in the maxillary sinus, the upper teeth, and sometimes it, so the eye is feeling like beyond the lip, and uh, there is there is some pain in the eye, but most of the pain is down below the eye, uh, and it feels like somebody is stabbing you with a knife, time and time again, for a cluster of a few minutes, and it will it will go away. It can it will come. It's called cluster headache uh, because. It will come, it can come 10, 15, 20 times a day, each time it will last for anywhere between five minutes and 20 minutes. And then in between the headache goes away to zero. But when you have the headache, it's extremely, extremely painful. It's virtually, they feel like somebody put a knife into them. When you look at it, the, the, most, the most obvious sign of it is that everything pours out of the eye. Uh, the eye completely went and everything falls out of it. It really gave, gave rise to the concept that uh, cluster headache is mostly driven by abnormal regulation of the parasympathetic nervous system. And that this is because of the cycling of that. Uh, the concept it is that it is related to broken down a uh, biological clock for circadian rhythm. And it is the hypothalamus that it is at the origin of that. There are a few studies, imaging studies, that shows that it is, that there is some of it on the peripheral area and some of it uh, just posterior to the posterior hypothalamus. Uh, not uh, uh, studies that give rise to a whole host of uh, surgeries in patients because they are so desperate where, uh, where either lesions were made in the area that we, that, uh, where imaging was thought to trigger the headache, uh, this cluster headache or deep brain stimulation, uh, for most part, it stopped because uh, even this procedure drove a patient to commit a suicide. And uh, well, by the time the patient number four did it, commit a suicide in Belgium, for most part, it stopped. The cluster headache is completely different. There's almost no similarities to migraine beside the parasympathetic nervous system, which is involved in migraine headache, if you judge by nasal congestion and teary eyes and, uh, and feeling like your skin is hot and burning or cold and freezing and frequent yawning, frequent urination, a whole lot of things that are related to, auto to the autonomic nervous system. Wow, that sounds incredibly heartbreaking. Uh. Do other people have questions about types of headaches and migraines? Oh, uh, okay. If there's no other more questions, or shall I go more or less to follow my talk? Well, I guess we can move ahead. Um, All right. So I'm going to jump from uh, to to different things. Uh, so uh, let me just let me just chill screen. Huh? All right, so uh, this is a lecture that I prepared by Trillidas. Uh, 
Uh, so I think that uh, that uh, let, let me just show you a few data and take you to the story and see see where we go from there. So uh, the ballpark where we think about migrant really start in anatomical connection. And uh, if I have to put it with the smallest amount of details, basically we know that there are the trigeminal ganglion is the ganglion, sensory ganglion that sends signal from the cranium from the face and the head. Uh, the cell bodies uh, in the ganglion send action that goes in the context of headache to the pia, uh, to the dura, they cross sutures of the scalp and make it on the way to the periosteum into some muscles. Se pain signal from all of those make it into the spinal cord, in the, into the upper cervical spinal cord, the C1, C2, and the nucleus caudalis called the spinal cord nucleus. Neurons there send signals to, almost, to multiple nuclei in the brainstem, like the parasympathetic nucleus, the power breaker, the PAG, a whole lot. There's a long, long list of them. I just put a few of them. Uh, they go directly to the hypothalamus, to the amygdala, to the nucleus accumbens, to the septal nuclei. They go to a, lo to a large number of uh, subcortical areas that play a role in a whole lot of things, in addiction and emotion and uh, a whole lot of things. And from there, if you follow these neurons that are activated during migraine, during a whole host of studies, uh, you see that they really project, maybe it's unique to headache, maybe not, but as you can see maybe by the, by the brain here, a single neuron that is activated along the migraine pathway can project to the motor cortex of the insula, to S1, S2, whatever the, the pain matrix, the parental association area, auditory cortex, lacrospinus, ectorhinal, V1, V2. Basically, if you look at it and you make the list uh, and you make, you just adjust some functional things, you really look at, you see that you have a ballpark to think about irritability and anger and anxiety and fear and low energy and depression and yawning and urination and teary eyes and, and a whole host of uh, cortical functions that are related to extreme sensitivity to light, noise, smell, uh, being clumsy, uh, having uh, difficulty with spatial orientation, with, uh, with uh, amnesia, with a whole host of things. So basically, it is th this defined to us the ballpark of how we think about migraine. Now, when we do that, we have to remember two things. Uh, the anatomy alone is uh, anachronistic that belongs to many years earlier. Uh, the, um, the way we thought about the, about migraine many years ago. Now we know that almost each each station along this pathway is dynamic and it changes in two conditions. It changes along along the duration of a single migraine attack. The way all these neurons behave in the first 10 minutes or 20 minutes after the onset of migraine is completely different than the way they behave four, five, six hours or three days after the migraine started, number one. Number two, many of these neurons behave differently 20 years after the migraine started than in the first five years of having a migraine. All those change, which really brings us to, to a question that uh, I probably won't have time to answer it, but let me just let me just bring it up. So, if I don't sleep one two, one or two nights, I don't get a headache. Most of you won't. If I if I skip a meal or two or three, I don't get a headache. If I get too hot or too cold, I don't get a headache. If I get stressed because I have to review twenty grants or whatever, I don't get a headache. Migrant patients can do that. They get stressed, they get a headache. They skip a meal, they don't eat their small four meals a day, they get a headache. They don't sleep enough, they don't get their seven hours of sleep or six hours of sleep, they get a headache. They sleep too long, they get a headache. What is it that makes migrant patients so vulnerable to all these changes in homeostasis? It can be physiological homeostasis, it can be emotional homeostasis, 
What is it that makes them so vulnerable to that? We really don't know the answer to that. The biggest question that we are asking is, were they born like this? Is this a result of genetics, which would be very complicated to explain? Or is it a result of having the hypothalamus bombarded by millions and millions of pain signals for three days at the, three days at the time for 10 and 20 and 30 and 40 years? Is it, is it alteration of hypothalamic function as a result of having migrant so many years and having, uh, you know, if 10,000 neurons from the spinal cord project the hypothalamus and send pain signals, you, if, and you try to calculate how many pain signals, how many uh, gets to the hypothalamus during the course of one migraine attack, and then you think about patients that have migraine 30 days a month, 20 days a month, there's a patient that comes to the clinic, you realize that, or, that there is a price to pay, that the brain pays, that the brain pays, along the course of the migraine attack. So this is where we are moving around. Let me take you uh, just, uh, let me take you quickly through just basic pathophysiology of the headache part of migraine. So for many years, we knew that the, we thought that the system is hardwired, pain signal in migraine come from the meninges. Mostly the, active, the pain itself comes when pain fibers that innovate uh, intracranial blood vessels, mostly in a door, way less so in the fear, uh, get activated and send pain signal from the ganglion to the spinal trigeminal nucleus, where the pain usually is referred to the periorbital area because the converge of neurons that receive most of the input from the ophthalmic bunch of the trigeminal nerve and not from the maxillary or mandibular, which explain why the pain is referred here. Under a normal condition, none of us is aware of the space between our brain and our skull. And it is really the migrant patient that one or two hours after the headache starts and the headache begins to throb because now, because during migraine when the, when the receptors get sensitized, uh, they begin to detect changes in intracranial pressure that under normal conditions, the absence of migraine, they would not detect, and uh, which will explain to us the throbbing and explain to us, to us why when you bend over and intracranial pressure increases to 20 millimeter mercury from four for a few seconds, the headache will become more painful. But it also explains to us all these migraine patients that tell us that during migraine, they feel like there isn't enough room in their head for the brain. The brain is too big, but there is so much pressure in their head that they want that they want somebody to drill a hole and get the pressure out. It is think about patient who tell you, who tell you that they become aware of the space between the brain and the bone. And how many of you can do that? Unless you have a headache that is associated with what we call peripheral sensitization, you don't get the throbbing and the pressure inside the head and feeling that your brain is too big. We can basically image it with Function with different imaging technique. If we compare, if we look at the trigeminal ganglion, and we can now image the ophthalmic maxillary mandibular division of trigeminal ganglion uh, under different manipulation during migraine, absence of migraine, and see the abnormal signal that we get during migraine. Along with the sensitization, we know that, my, that there are neurons in the spinal trigeminal nucleus. That, are, that usually respond only to pain, which means if you cut yourself or you pull your hair, it will hurt, it, it, they will fire, but if you just brush your hair or touch yourself, they will not, they will be quiet. We know that these neurons receive input from at least three sources from inside the head, so you know, they saw so one nerve, from the periorbital area, so the ophthalmic bunch of the general nerve, and from muscles of the neck, uh, from those of the ganglion of C2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, okay, under normal condition, if you, if you bend your head and you stretch your muscle neck, it doesn't help. During migraine, it does. Uh, during migraine, if you put a baseball head, it hurts. If you wear glasses, it hurts. Uh, if you try to brush your eyebrows, it hurts. Uh, there's, there's, 
a whole host of things that migrant patients tell us that that hurt their skin and the muscles during migraine. It is usually it usually developed two to four hours after the headache start, and it really suggests to us that neurons that usually are respond 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 only to painful stimuli become sensitized and begin to respond to non painful stimulation uh, from from usually the skin and the muscle, which will explain what we call allodynia uh, or hyperalgesia uh, in the skin in migraine patients and uh, why muscle tenderness develop after the onset of migraine. Uh, the concept that the skin become hypersensitive was uh, described in the 1800s. It was called the painful health syndrome, uh, but nobody paid attention to it because it didn't make any sense. But the concept here is that this neuron turn from become sensitized, we can image it in the spinal progenitor nucleus. And if you record from this neuron in animal, you see how their activity will, the activity which has whatever baseline, if you activate the system from the meninges for five minutes, the, the, the activity will increase and stay up for 16 hours when, when you do the recording. So what it does is it explain to us, all those patients tell us that the skin is so hypersensitive during my uh, along this line, if you move along the pathway into the thalamus uh, and we record from mm -hmm. these neurons, you see that a neuron that will respond only to painful stimulation in the good little green here, when we record from these neurons and animals, it will, like uh, four hours after we activate the neuron by putting some inflammatory mediators in the meninges and the neuron, the neuron will turn from red to green and become to respond to non painful stimulation, stronger than to respond to painful stimulation. And if we do this in human, we basically find that in human, it happened the same. It just happened in a part of the thalamus that we didn't know what to do. It. It's called the pulvinal, which we thought is a, a high order a visual a nucleus that process vision. And the, however, in human, if there are five subdivisions to that, and one of them, the most anterior one, appear to integrate somatosensory and visual information. And the, if you think about it, the posterior nucleus in rats uh, disappeared along evolution. And in human, it doesn't exist. In human, there's the pulmonary. Uh, so what we record in, in animals, usually in, in posterior thalamic nuclei, or ultra posterior, uh, usually disappear and move, appear in the pulmonary in human. What it does to us, it explains to us how a headache can, can develop into a whole body allodynia and hyperalgesia four hours after the onset of migraine. When patients say, well, I can't wear tight clothes anymore. I can't have a heavy blanket. I can't go to the shower. I have to take off uh, socks and belts and bras and every jewelry is that everything that I can't let anybody touch me, no massage, no anything. Uh, no, uh, no, you know, no hugging, a whole host of things that migrant patients tell us. And it's really the, the headache part that it, it's really the, the changes that occur along, the, along this pathway from the meninges to the ganglion, to the spinal germinal, to so the thalamus, to the cortex that explain to us, uh, that, uh, we, that explain to us what patients tell us uh, from doing both imaging studies and in, in human and electrophysiological studies in, in animals. All right. Uh, so, of course, the reason why this is important is because uh, if you put a timetable, you say that the sensitization here developed 20 minutes after the onset of migraine. Here it takes two to four hours after the onset of migraine. And here it takes four hours or more after the onset of migraine. Uh, you realize that if you treat migraine patients, drugs, they don't enter the central nervous system. It uh, should only be used, should only be used early in the migraine attack when the generator of the headache seems to be in, in the periphery. However, if you wait too long, and now the generator, if you want to call it, moves centrally now, uh, which we can predict based on figuring out if the skin is hypersensitive. Uh, now, drugs that should abort migraine or drugs that should target the central nodes. So. What I tell you is really, it's important scientifically, but more, more than that, it is important because if we, if we diagnose it in patients in a simple way, it 
it to guide treatment. Treatment option, what dog we give patient depends on how many years they migrant and on how many hours after the or minutes after the dance of migrant they decide to treat. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna make you a quick jump to photophobia uh, because uh, because it is really this study that took me into photophobia. Unless you want to stop and open it for discussion, because I can take it in so many different directions. Um, I do see that we have in the ch chat a question about the earlier topic of the different types of uh, headaches. Shall we go ahead with that or kind of come back towards the end to that? Uh, let's, get, let's get back to that at the end. Okay. All right. So I'm, uh, so I'm not taking you through so the lymphatic system and how, uh, and the question of how what happened in the brain can activate the pain fiber uh, outside the brain, while right? the brain is inside the blood and barrier, the pain fibers are outside the blood and barrier, how a headache, uh, how abnormal brain activity can end up activating a pain fiber, uh, because it, it takes us in a completely different direction uh, of microphages, the dendritic cell, the immune cell, the lymphatic system. Uh, in the vascular. Uh, I'm gonna, like I said, uh, take you really briefly so the, so the just highlight on of the, of photophobia and the uh, without going to the details and uh, see, and then open it for any direction that you want. So uh, when we were recording from these neurons, uh, just on one of this experiment with my, uh, one of uh, my, Technician actually was supposed to uh, to turn on the light at the end of the day because we do the recording in the dark uh, and make a lesion to know exactly where we recorded. And before she did it, uh, she I think took a break. And when she came back, uh, she realized that when we turn on the light, the activity of the neuron increased. Now, just because an activity of the neuron increased, it means absolutely nothing. But because uh, I work with migrant patient. And migrant patients suffer tremendously from photophobia, which, which is defined as exacerbation of the headache by light. And because photophobia is one of the most bothersome symptoms of migrant, in other words, it is the number one lead of decline in quality of life because, uh, because when they are when they have a migraine and they're sensitive to light, they go to a dark room, which means they quit work, they quit being with the kids, they quit functioning at home, at work. Uh, and, uh, and quitting on life in, in, att in attacks that come 10, 20, 30 times a month, uh, eventually have a huge toll both on family life and on work and career. So uh, because I work on, because I, see patients with photophobia, I paid, I, we paid attention to try to figure out uh, what does that all mean. So as I moved into the field, I'm going to just make it really, really simple. Uh, the biggest debate that I walked into was whether the ability of light to make the headache more painful depends on pain signal that travel along the trigeminal nerve or photic signals that travel along the optic nerve. 50 years of debate without any answers uh, because nobody, had, because there was no way to really test it. So uh, the first study that I did, I'm just jumping into that, was uh, I, I looked for people who don't have optic nerve and have mic and, uh, and asked them if in, the, if in the absence of optic nerve, the light makes the headache more painful. So it doesn't matter how I found them, but they found them. And uh, basically, migrant patients that don't have optic nerve, the optic nerve is completely gone, as evident by the fact that they have no light perception. Right? If you close your eyes and you are, and somebody turn on and off the light, you know whether there's light in the room or dark, even though you can't see anything. They don't have that. The patient with absolutely no light perception, no pupillary light reflex messed up circadian frontal entrainment, uh, no, no ability to perceive light. And these patients during migraine, you shine light into them, they have, they have 
no light does not make the headache more painful. Really telling you that the optic nerve is critical for, for the phobia. Uh, it was really the simplest question to answer once you find, once uh, we found these patients. Uh, well, it became a little, a little bit more interesting was as when we were, when, because I was looking for people who are legally blind and have migraine, uh, I, uh, what we found was those patients who have alternative pigmentosa, liver congenital amaurosis, a whole host of retinal degenerative diseases that, that eliminate most of the odds and cons, but nevertheless, they can still, still detect light. So until the late 1990s, early 2000s, we had no idea how somebody without odds and cons uh, can see anything. Although the concept of light with outside came from Harvard from many, many years ago. Uh, we, in, after 2000, we knew that we learned that there are retinal ganglion cells, about 1% to 2% of all retinal ganglion cells in the human retina contain a third class of uh, photoreceptors called melanopsin. And it is this melanopsin that allows, allows this patient to perceive light. Uh, without creating any image, so it's light without sight. And these patients do have pupillary light reflex intact. The circadian rhythm is more or less intact, and light makes the headache more pain. So uh, we, what we knew is we, at the time from other people is uh, that retinal, that melanopsinergic retinal ganglion cells in the human retina project the suprachiasmatic nucleus and the intergenic reflect and the, the, the olivary protector nucleus all. So this connects to the pupillary light reflex, this to look, connect to, to the sleep cycle that will explain, explain that. And as we went through that, uh, we had to go back to two quick anatomical studies. First, figure out how in the world everybody, how in the world nobody pay attention uh, to this little brown hair that leaves the main visual pathway uh, and uh, from the and goes into the posterior thalamic nucleus. I found it in old slides from flip second anatomical studies uh, that looked at the posterior thalamic nucleus and show all these projections that that, that uh, really uh, that caught our attention because this is where most nodes that are activated during migraine appear in uh, appear to be located. So this was just a regular one uh, of uh, labeling all retinal ganglion cells. Uh, then we went and with some fancy uh, then associated retrovirus technique labeled only the axons of uh, retinal ganglion cells that contain melanopsin. Basically what you see is that the melanopsinergic neurons project to this part of the thalamus that contain uh, the neurons that are activated during migraine. Uh, so if we, when we went back to the recording, and of course we know what the response, electrical response of retinal of a retinal ganglion cell that contains melanopsin look like. It has a very sharp response that decline that uh, declines slowly over a period of long, long period of time. Not like the non-IPRGC nodes that have a big bus at the onset and offset of the stimulus, and the activity looked very similar to the activity of the retina of the neurons that are activated during migraine that we record in the thalamus. Look how, how the activity here really resembles to us input that we get from the IPRGC rather than from, uh, from non-image forming, uh, from retinal ganglion cells that are not uh, photo, photosensitive. Okay, so uh, some fancy anatomy. And, uh, we, and so we do a then assess a lot of virus uh, that has the fluorescent green and basically look and then stick and fill neurons in the thalamus that are activated during migraine with red. And that's what you see. You see that the neurons that are activated during migraine get direct monosynaptic input uh, that connect with the cell soma, with the proximal and the distal dendrites quite a bit, many, many of these examples. So it really suggests that light that, that the visual system converge on neurons that are activated during migraine, uh, that are activated during migraine uh, pretty, uh, pretty heavily. So 
skipping uh, a lot of where well, this known project. So if you do it, you can also follow their actions into the cortex. And I'm not going to go into all of that, but uh, if I have to kind of give you a concept of all of this, only this is what it comes to. It comes to the fact that uh, during migraine, the, the red pathway are activated the transgenic vascular system, the pain signal flow along the tentorial nerve, protective ganglion, spinal transgenic nucleus, to the posterior, not your posterior thalamic nuclei. Uh, these neurons very specifically receive direct input from, from IPRGC, from inter intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell, the melanin synergic one, and probably from non melanin synergic. And when you record from these neurons, you realize that when you turn on the light, the activity increase way beyond the, the activation during headache, during, during, during migraine. Now, the big surprise that came here was that, yes, this neuron project to S1, S2, and the insula. We can seek and fill them the same neurons with the same technique and, and reconstruct their axons uh, in the different uh, layers of the cortex in S1, S2, and the insula, which will explain to us how light can exacerbate the perception of headache. What we did expect is to find these neurons, that these neurons, because they're in the, in the polygonal, also project to the primary and secondary visual cortices. Now, I mean, which are large and very dense projection. Now, the reason why this, this is important is because Migrant patients com very commonly complain about visual disturbances during migraine, double vision, blurred vision, and uh, and color and messed up color perception. The color look either washed and white or too saturated. Clearly, visual disturbances in visual perception. So the concept here that came is that there is another connection that can explain to us how light can make a headache more painful and how pain can alter visual perception. Okay, so uh, as, uh, let me just give you a two second story because otherwise it, you will not understand my next question. When, I, when we published these studies uh, within 24 hours, I counted 7,000 websites that advertise a uh, contact lens that, uh, that block and, and glasses that block the blue light for the treatment of migraine. The reason for it is because they all knew that melanopsin is more, is more sensitive to blue light, while right? the peak is around the, around the 480. And, and, uh, and we also wrote that the migraine patient, the blind migraine patient with light perception said to us that their headache is worse on a snowy day and a cloudy day rather than on sunny day, where the light tend to be more along the, the family of blue light. So as this came, uh, of course, they didn't understand that the 36 million Americans that have migraine are not blind and blocking the blue light won't make a difference in them unless it's only melanopsy. But it gave us, a, and it gave us an, it brought and a really interesting question up, and that was, does color play a role in photophobia? So uh, we went and brought migrant patients with normal eyesight and uh, exposed them to white, blue, green, amber, and red light. And basically, uh, very early in the study, this is what came. What came is that, uh, it's not the question, uh, what came is that white, blue, amber, and red, starting at one candelas per meter square, which is, what if a regular room light is about 100 candelas per meter square or 100 lux, you realize that one is tiny, tiny, tiny amount of light. That starting at one, a different colors of light make the headache more painful. It was green to, when it's not regular, I'll tell you about it, whether green takes a completely different direction or it makes the headache less painful, uh, for most part, beside the highest intensity. And uh, that, that fits by how much the light makes the headache pain, more painful, fits perfectly patient perception. It doesn't go from pain of uh, one to pain of 10, it goes from pain of two to pain of uh, four, from pain of five to pain of seven, which is not much, but it is enough to 
cause the threshold of, uh, of the pain uh, moving from being bearable to being unbearable. It is unbearable, it's not functional. All right, so uh, we, we, that, was the, that was the observation, uh, trying to explain it. Uh, we spent a lot of time learning how to do electroethnography and uh, figure out uh, whether and figure out a way to measure the electrical signal that the retina sent into the brain in migrant patients. And as we went through the study, and there's a whole a whole lot of things that what is the A wave and the B wave, what belong to cons, what belong to rods, a uh, high frequency rods cannot follow, only cons can follow, a low intensity light, only con, only rods can follow, not cons. There's a whole lot of things. And basically, this is what it comes to. It comes to the fact that when you do a, either high flickering or single flash right here, the, the A wave, which is most, which is cones only, uh, show us, try to, it shows us that the blue light send a signal that is, uh, that is significantly larger than all other colors of light. And when you do the flickering light, which is a little bit different, you begin to see a distinction between blue and red, the, the magnitude of the ELG between blue, red, amber, or yellow and white versus green. All right. Uh, so that's one thing that, that different colors of light send different magnitude of electrical signal uh, from the eye to the brain, and green is always the smallest. Number two, maybe the most important, is the following because perception determines the cortex. If you go into in this patient and you do visual evoked potential, uh, which is always messy because it uh, depends on on a huge number of things, and you measure the N two P two, which is the most common, uh, you measure this magnitude, which is the most common one. You realize that you have to do not hundred but thousand, thousand, thousand of repetition until you get the you get the signal that you can. Uh, you filter and clean and amplify and, and get get the red signal. When when you do that, basically that that's what comes out. What comes up that in a cortex, red and blue generate the largest evoke potential, visual evoke potential. Then come amber and black and white, and then come the green. The reason why this is so important is the following. Basically, tell us that electrophysiology in human is way more sensitive than psychophysics because when we ask migrant patients to wait to us the difference between white, blue, amber, and red, they all told us that blue and red are most painful, then come amber and white that are more painful than green, but less painful than red and blue, and the green is completely different. We never got it statistically significant. But this is what the, this was their perception. So we could not claim it here. But clearly, the electrophysiology in the retina and the electrophysiology in the cortex shows us what patient perception was, even though we couldn't get it, we could not get it, uh, we couldn't get it uh, in, in uh, statistically. Now, uh, if we take it, so this we can do in human. What we can do in human is we cannot go to the cortex to the thalamus, uh, not at this level. So in the thalamus is what I'm going to say there was a cluster with me now, uh, then is a faculty now. We did multi multiple unit recording, and you can see here recording from posterior, larger posterior VPM from different parts, a recording from like 20 neuron at the time. If you look at it, basically that's what it comes to. It comes to the fact that, for example, if you take the one of these nuclei, you see that the largest activation, longest come to blue uh, and then to white and to green, it's the least one and reds don't see red, so you don't get anything. All right, so uh, that was one way to try to explain how light make the headache more painful. I think the most interesting part of it was that uh, we jumped into something very different. When we asked patients to tell us why light make the headache more painful, this is what we got. These are the words that we got. It makes me anxious, angry, irritable, agitated, nervous, hopeless, needy, sad, scary, cranky. Basically, a whole host of negative emotions. 
some positive emotion are coming, soothing, relaxing, mellow, happy, laughing. Some, a whole host of autonomic responses like chest tightness, throat tightness, fast heart rate, fast breathing, shortness of breath, a whole host of sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, symptoms that are commonly associated with migraine, like dizziness, lightheadedness, vertigo, uh, nausea, vomiting, a whole host of things. So, because they, dif they, they differentiated between migraine patient, non migraine patient, and during migraine, not during migraine, uh, there was a question that came up how, how can that happen? So, and does it define photophobia as aver this aversion to light rather than light to make that more painful? So, in a whole host of studies, we follow, we follow the, we try to figure out how light connect through the hypothalamus into migraine, into the sympathetic nervous system, made all this connection basically between uh, neurons in different hypothalamic area that project to the, the project to the sympathetic preganglionic neurons and are activated during migraine. You see all these connections to try to, to put the ballpark for explaining chest tightness, blood tightness, uh, fast breathing, increased heart rate, dry mouse. We did the same with the parasympathetic nervous system to follow the superior salvatore nucleus that can explain to us a general concept. And really, if you look at it, this is what it comes to. Light connect with neurons that contain in hypothalamus that contain dopamine and histamine that will relate to sleep, dopamine and may relate to mood, a orexin that relates to sleep and food, a MCH, a vasopressin, a orexin, that will maybe the happy, the happy hormone uh, that will really take us into a ballpark of trying to understand all these negative and positive emotions and yawning and thirst and sleepy and drowsy and tired and hungry and hot flashes and a whole host of things that we see in migrant patients. Uh, now I'm giving all of this to you without any data. I'm just summarizing to you concept of things that well, that we're doing. And what I think that what has to come out of it was, so here it is. Uh, as we went through that, I'm touching it in the last uh, second of my talk. So uh, as we try to figure out what is it about green light, and there's a whole lot of that I've been talking about. Uh, if you look at the regular room light, this is the spectrum of wavelengths start in the blue, big, big, then the green, the red, all the way, the human. Now, so what we did then is we devised, we made a lamp, a, a light bulb that has a, that created a wavelength of 10 nanometer. Basically, 95% of the light that we emit falls within 10 nanometer or around the 520 nanometer. The reason why we chose 20 nanometer is because it is the only place where the sensitive, photosensitivity of the short and long wave photoreceptor that we take the blue and the red is minimal. And, uh, and this is what we took forward into, we took forward into the market, we patented this. So just to tell you in one second about it, because I think, I think it's interesting. So the first light bulb cost $50,000. We then, I then connected with engineers in NASA that made the light bulb for the space shuttle and asked them to try to figure out how to make this light bulb to be $150 or less than $100. It took several years to get there. Uh, but once we got it, uh, we put it out there in the market in the car with company called the land. And, uh, and we're giving it to migrant patients because it is non-invasive and it has no side effects and it's 100% safe. And the average cost of migraine drugs is, of a single migraine drug for migraine is $21,000 a year. And uh, we can give patients probably something that will last for 15 years uh, for a price of about uh, one to $200. So this is just, this is just the concept. So uh, what I would like to do is open it, we have half an hour, open it for, a discussion I can take you into many directions of, of cognitive functions and only focused on 
on anorexia and only focus on food roll and only focus on sleep. Well, uh, I need to know where you where you want me to take it uh, with questions. So I'm going to stop you. Maybe before stopping it, because I, I'm happy to continue. Uh, there are many people who work with me. I don't know, as you know, I don't do it by myself. All the animal studies are done with Rodrigo and with Vanessa, they are here, Rodrigo is still here. And with a large number of clinicians who work with me on the on different parts. And of course, this is my disclosure. I have an edge grant and funding from the industry uh, that helped me figure out how to help the patients. So uh, I'm happy to stop here and open it for any discussion uh, you want. So please feel free to raise your hands, type something in the chat box. I had a quick question, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, so I come from a neuroendocrinology lab and I was wondering, given the fact that migraine is so much more common in females and it's more common to have an attack at the beginning of menses, what do you hypothesize as the potential physiological role of, you know, 17 beta estradiol or other sex steroid hormones in migraine pathology? Uh, we don't know the answer to that. It's really, I was wondering if you had a theory. <laughs> we don't know the answer. Yeah. Uh, all hormonal replacement therapies in all directions fail, mm -hmm. didn't work. We, we probably hurt a large number of women by unnecessarily uh, supplement and withdraw from them different sex hormones. And, uh, and it, it really didn't make a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I think that uh, menstrual migraine and the role of sex hormone in migraine is one of the largest big holes that we have. We really don't understand it. Uh, everything that we try to go we, we make observation again and again because the NIH wants us to every study we, we do to study men and women, even though it's mostly a uh, women's disease. Uh, so yeah, we show difference between men and women, but we can't really figure it out. Uh, even it's just, we are right now, we are thought at the, the, it is huge fit to walk into, we, we don't have an answer to that. And of course, what complicated is or these women who get their first migraine at the beginning of menopause, and these migraines are the most difficult to treat, and they stay into their 70s and 80s and 90s with that, mm -hmm. and, and they, they don't respond to migraine medication. Yeah. So we have a question in the chat box that I can read out about the lamp. <clears throat> um, so from Azmin. Uh, could you comment on the high price of the original lamp? It seems that the light bulb should be fairly easy to manufacture in a specific light spectrum. So, uh, right. So the original one, uh, the original one was an FDA approved for uh, for a diagnosis of retinal degenerative diseases. That's why it was so expensive. But uh, I think that the biggest issue is LED is the dimming. How do you dim it to one candelas per meter square and five candelas per meter square? It's almost impossible to dim LED. Number one, number two, if you look directly at the LED, uh, it, is, uh, it is really obnoxious. Doesn't matter what it is, you need to uh, shield it in a way that will make it, uh, will make it uh, that the outcome that comes is not, uh, is more, more painful and obnoxious uh, than, than the light. So it's not enough to generate just the LED light bulb, which I agree you can do in three cents. It is how you place it into something that the patient can use. Thank you. More questions? Hi, uh, this is uh, Charles Jennings. Hi, uh, very interesting talk, thank you. Um, can you, you mentioned that there's a strong hereditary component to, to migraine, but are, are there also environmental risk factors identified? I mean, for the development of susceptibility as distinct from the triggers for the attacks themselves. So 
I think the answer is no. There is nothing that we know today about environmental susceptibility. And, uh, and I think that one of the evidence for that is if you look at the incidence of uh, migrants around the world, it really does differ between Africa and South America and the Western world. And uh, it looks quite similar. The studies that come from, from Japan, China, India, uh, South Africa, Ethiopia, wherever, and, and you know, all European countries uh, in the United States look very similar. And assuming that people in, the, in different communities uh, are exposed to different environments, you would probably pick up some environmental changes. We think that for most part, it is, uh, it is genetic. What does trigger migraine are events that I, I don't call environmental, right? A traumatic brain injury uh, triggers migraine like headache, post trauma. Uh, all the you know the soldiers that come from Iraq and Afghanistan after being neck to side or bone all have headaches that develop into a migraine. Uh, NFL players, hockey players, uh, soccer players that use their head, the most most kids with concussion develop migraine like headache. Uh, so it's not true migraine, but it has the migraine symptoms. So. Uh, Maybe you can call it environmental, but it isn't. So I'm, I think that uh, because you knew a little about migraine, my lecture kind of drifted more toward sharing with you the clinical aspect of it rather than the basic science. Uh, but there is a huge amount of basic science that uh, uh, that that takes us into trying to explain, okay, so if you don't sleep enough, you get the migraine. How does it work? How can normal abnormal activity in the hypothalamus end up hurting you around the eye? What is the, where, where, where how does it go? Uh, or, you know, a whole host of questions that are really related to mechanism to, to try to explain all the things that, that we talked about. I have a question about you, you know, talked about a lot of migraine patients, they need to have enough sleep and not too little sleep or not too much sleep and eat, uh, you know, a number of meals throughout the day, not skip a meal. I'm curious how consistent these habits are from patient to patient, or do you find that for some patients, you know, five hours of sleep is the answer, eight hours of sleep is the right, or is there a consistent regimen that seems to work for, for all patients? Right, so there isn't. All we do is we tell them that uh, their brain is really conservative and they can't mess up with it. Whatever, if if uh, it's personalized, if they uh, if they need to sleep seven hours a night to feel good, they have to sleep the seven hours a night. And there are some patients who need to sleep only six hours, but there are patients who need to sleep ten hours. And if they don't sleep ten hours, they'll wake up with a migraine. But that within the patient, it's consistent. What, yeah, what is less consistent, which is one of the biggest puzzles of an uh, unanswered question in migraine, is, uh, is uh, brain rhythm or rhythms of activity in a brain, which really connects us to the world of allostatic, uh, allostatic load. Uh, and that is, so uh, you get, so uh, if you're exposed to perfume, most migrant patients will get a migrant if they're exposed to perfume. But it will happen to them one out of 10 times. So if 10 times they're exposed to perfume, in nine times they will not get the migrant, and in one time they will get the migrant. And it's true for almost all migrant triggers for wine and cheese and chocolate and coffee and being stressed and, and, and being a whole host of things. What is it that determines the millisecond where exposure to perfume will trigger migraine or will not trigger migraine. Uh, this is huge because it's related to how the how different parts of the brain regulate the cortical thalamic and the thalamocortical output uh, that connects it into that. And I think that for most part it all, it is also connect with uh, with incidents of being too tired and not getting a migraine and incidents of being too tired and do get a migraine.
hey, if nobody else has a question, I'm going to ask another one. Um, can you comment on the validity of, uh, or otherwise, of uh, animal models? It seems like it's a very difficult, very complex condition to model. Uh, right, that's correct. Uh, so there are multiple, there are many animal animal models of mine. None of them is perfect, uh, but there are animal models uh, that really takes, uh, that really follow uh, intravenous uh, administration of drugs that consistently trigger mine, like nitroglycerin, uh, like CGRP, a, a whole lot of maybe 20 or 30 of them, but the, the, the natural, uh, but, but by far the natural glycerin, the GPM, and the CGRP are the most commonly used uh, drugs to consistently trigger a migraine like or a headache like behavior in, in animals. Uh, there are other models of using inflammatory soup uh, that is, and it's all based on repeated administration to the chronic. Uh, if you model chronic migraine, and if it, it's using one administration, if you use, if you use an acute, uh, there is a the model of cortical spotting depression uh, that uh, mimics the aura and now can be used as after genetics, so you don't have to go into, you don't have to go inside. Uh, there, are, uh, there, there are now models of uh, stress, like uh, exposing them to a huge amount of, uh, of noise or a, a whole lot of physiological and social stress that can trigger this behavior. Uh, the outcomes are many, uh, there are many uh, outcome, behavioral outcome that we read. And of course there is all the electrophysiological recording from along this progenitor vascular pathways and see how different neurons and different places get activated in each of these animal, in, the, in each of these animal models. But the behavior, matured into we can measure photophobia and place performance and the uh, grimacing and the uh, any and the uh, uh, downing the uh, whether how much time they spend on how careful they are when they try to eat because their lips are sensitive to the skin. Uh, there are there are a uh, several models that uh, that uh, were that became that are validated. Uh, you described uh, at the beginning that uh, strange phenomenon in which an attack can jump from one side of the brain to the other. Has that ever been seen in animal models? No. <laughs> no, I don't think that we have any, any animal model that uh, will mimic the unilateral part of it. Unless you activate the pathway on one side, if you activate it in the meninges on one side, you will usually get uh, you will get activation of neurons with receptive field on the on one side, uh, but the behavioral we have not seen it behavioral. Excellent question. Mm -hmm. Hi. Thank you. I can't hear you. All right, so a uh, I just opened the chat to look. So there is a, a with iPhone, right? There's a question of why some situ in some situations does migraine overlap with tension type headache. Uh, so, uh, so, the, so the answer to that is that uh, the, the common denominator to them, the common denominator to them is a uh, mass tenderness in neck muscles, which is a part of migraine headache, uh, and it's definitely a part of tension type headache. Uh, I think that if you have to summarize briefly, uh, the, the more fundamental summary would be the tension type headache uh, originate outside the calvaria, or is migraine for most part originate inside the calvaria, but 
because tension diabetic is felt mostly in the back of the head and in most of the neck, uh, was uh, and migraine also have these uh, these symptoms of neck tenderness and occipital headache. Uh, they uh, they mix together a lot, although a uh, tension diabetic is uh, way more challenging to get rid of the migraine. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go into so the comment, uh, Andrew, could you comment on the link between migraine and spreading depression physiology? Uh, I can without showing you the data. It's a completely different picture. Uh, so the connection is that cortical spreading depression can give rise to a sequence of neuronal inflammatory cellular and vascular reaction responses that end up in the activation of pain fibers that are that whose activation uh, is at the origin of the headache phase of migraine. Uh, that's the connection. Cortical spreading depression can end up trigger activating the pain fibers. Uh, so a very complicated mechanism because cortical spreading depression is inside the blood vessel barrier and the pain fibers are outside. But uh, it's a com it's uh, that will take time to answer, uh, especially since the hypothalamus region you study in migraine are near the median eminence, which like blood vessel. Is there any evidence that circulating factors in blood contribute to the changes in the activity you measure in hypothalamus during migraine? Uh, so yes, it is an excellent question. Uh, the blood vein barrier is somewhat open in a hypothalamus. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, this question uh, comes mainly, so the answer to the question is yes, it's absolutely possible that uh, some molecule chemical that uh, circulating in the blood can contribute to the changes in the oral activity. We just don't know what they are. Uh, the question is much bigger than that because, uh, because at least currently the most common migraine drugs are too large to enter the brain. And uh, the question is whether they have any effect in hypothalamus is a very interesting question. Right now we, I don't see any evidence that molecules that can't enter the blood barrier anywhere can enter in hypothalamus. So yeah. I'm going to try to ask my question again. I apologize. Okay, I can't hear you. Ah. Uh, you, you can't hear me at all? I can now. Oh, okay. Um, very strange, uh, huh? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Um, okay, I'll, I'll try one more time. A any luck? No? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Yes, my so uh, uh, my computer was going nuts, but uh, if no one has brought up the auditory uh, connections yet, we had a lot of questions on on that, and I was curious when you talked about people who are blind being studied. I wondered if there were any studies on deaf individuals who had migraines. Uh, no, it, it is, uh, we don't have this, uh, because the auditory system crisscross right and left, at any point once it gets into the brain, it's very difficult to, uh, to uh, find patient or partially deaf, deaf in one ear, but not in the other ear, in, in a way that uh, that can translate into, they can be deaf in one ear, but, the, but what we hear from the other ear, a uh, crisscross in many places, uh, from the brain cell to the thalamus to the cortex, to the point that it's very difficult to, it's very difficult to study. Uh, so we don't have the same level of knowledge about phonophobia. Uh, then we have that we have about photophobia. But if anybody in this audience is interested 
in studying any the mechanism of phonophobia in migraine goes from animal model to a uh, human. This is a huge window of opportunity uh, to walk into. It'd be great to, to talk to anybody who wants to who wants to dive in. Thank you. Um, and uh, I don't know if uh, we've read out this question, but there were some questions on just big picture for the next many years. Um, so someone had type, sent during registration a question about in what research area, animal, cellular, clinical, do you think most headache centered uh, research uh, will be focusing on over the next 30 years? So it's a really huge question. Um, but in the second part is what are the fundamental unknowns? And I think you've talked about tons and tons of them, but I think the question might be, um, you know, what do you think are the most promising areas and maybe areas where basic scientists and clinicians could make the most progress in connecting right. them? Right. Actually, I, I uh, actually yes. I it is two questions that uh, I thought were very interesting, and uh, and I tried to summarize it. Uh, I tried to summarize it very quickly. I think that uh, uh, without going into details, uh, I think that uh, so. Here is the question: What is so special about migraine? Why is it not responding? To other pain medication. Why is it that pain medication, that medication that help other pain don't help migraine? Why is it that migraine medication don't are not approved for any other pain? They only approve for migraine. Uh, why are migraine symptoms uh, appear in migraine and not in other pain? Why is it photophobia unique to migraine? People with toe pain and, and toothache and earache uh, don't have photophobia. Uh, what what is it uh, that makes it? Uh, why is it that almost every drug approved by the FDA, if you look at the side effect, headache is one of them, but not tooth, not toothache or stomachache or toenail ache, what, or or any other or what what is it that makes the headache part the pain the pain part of migraine uh, so unique to migraine? Uh, so yes, stress, sleep, food, all of those being too hot, being too cold, pressure, all trigger a migraine. How does it happen? How can changes in my well, sleep? So it has to be orexin, it has to be histamine, it has to be MCH, it has to be then no, it has to be some something along the sleep, the the the, the neuronal circuits that regulate sleep. But how does it happen that it hurts around the eye on one side? What is what is the transition? How can abnormal activity in the hypothalamus, for example, or in any brain cell can end up with pain around the eye? But it's not the hypothalamus or the hypothalamus regulate regulation of brain functions and spinal cord by the hypothalamus, it's all global, bilateral. It's not, it's not unilateral. Uh, it's not speci specific to one part of the body. So how is it that all those end up with a pain that is a needle here? And, and so trying to understand how, what is so special to migrate? Uh, really defined the next 30 years, we have no idea. Th these questions, Oh, so we know a lot, but we know so little. Thank you so much. It's a really great, thorough answer. So and I can I can put seven hundred questions in in seven hundred minutes. Uh, there there is endless amount of opportunity to walk into this field. Uh, so there are many questions about. Uh, so headache and mind body techniques uh, is a question that came up yoga and tai chi and meditation so all of those work for migraine uh, they work anecdotally or studies the choice but there's no randomized control uh, trial that use placebo that shows benefit and because it's a western world and evidence-based medicine 
uh, is uh, based on on the most controlled trials, although the FDA does not have it. Uh, it's difficult for us to recommend it to patients, although there are there's a very large number of patients who say that all these relaxation techniques uh, help them with the minor. Uh, the mechanism, how this mechanism are triggered by hunger, lack of sleep, and stress. Uh, this is related to mechanism. There are many questions. There are questions about it. Uh, several questions. Uh, I can. I can. I. It's a different talk to show with you the knowledge that we do have, which is really the first step of uh, many many steps to try to come up with uh, how or is how it's related to migraine, which it does, but how it's related to the headache, which we don't know. Uh, CGRP is a different lecture. Uh, headache genetics is different lecture. There is a, there is a huge amount of information about uh, the, there are, I think, now 17 genes that have been isolated in different families, uh, in different countries that are related usually to known and hyper excitability. And, but, uh, uh, that's a different topic. Uh, linked to related condition, uh, what's the key therapeutic difference between treating peripheral pain and headache? We talked about it. Uh, there, are, uh, there are a lot of uh, differences that begin to appear related to sodium channel, to voltage gated sodium channel, to to GABA, to a whole lot of things that distinguish differential between the trigeminal nerve and the sciatic nerve, and they try to, to explain to us that migraine is not one more pain, it's different. The molecular mechanism of migraine appear to be different in, in relationship to the pain, not to the migraine itself, which is, a, which is a more complicated than just that. Uh, chronic migraine and possible effect on memory. Uh, this is a huge question that takes us into the lymphatic system and the relationship between migraine and cognitive decline. If it is there, uh, we know that it is there acutely during migraine, evidence that it is there for a prolonged period of time later in life or not. We don't have this evidence. Uh, we don't have to panic and think that if you have a migraine, you're going to develop Alzheimer's earlier or early on to dementia. Uh, there are some hints to that, but it's way, way, way too far from uh, having enough data that suggests it. Uh, but that's a different lecture. It's a lecture about how the brain clears itself out of molecular waste and toxins uh, during sleep versus during migraine. What, is the, what are the similarities and what are the differences, all this? Uh, so we have knowledge. I, it's, uh, you, I can't do it in one lecture. Uh, uh, what made someone susceptible to headache and migraine? I think that, that question came. Uh, uh, so I'm kind of skipping quickly. So some of the question, if you have any more questions and you're still on, just jump in. Do we have any final questions? Um, if not, it is 2.30, so we could conclude the talk. Um, so uh, thank you so, so much, Dr. Burstein. This was an incredible talk, a lot of topics covered. Um, and thank you to everyone for your awesome questions. Um, and yeah, feel free to reach out to us if you have ideas for other 101 series talks. Um, and yeah, we hope to work with you again, Dr. Burstein, some more talks. So thank you, everyone. Sure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.